happy Sabbath. We really hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Today, this Sabbath is the last Sabbath of November. And this evening we have the Heritage Concert at 4.30, come early so you can grab your seats. And then we're leaping into December with a new sermon with series. A new sermon series. Take it away. That's right. It, new sermon series, December 3. Uh, it's entitled The Gift. Pastor Randy's going to be looking at the Christmas story, particularly in Luke. And we're going to look at how God's favor rested often on the most unlikely people. It's going to be a powerful sermon series. It starts next week, December 3. Then don't forget, if you want to get involved and give back to families in need, we have Christmas baskets that are going to be, uh, we're going to be collecting things. The You Reach Ministry is going to be sponsoring that. If you want to be involved, maybe your office at work, maybe your family, maybe you want to get together with some friends. To do this, it's going to be December the 5th through the 7th. If you want all the details, go to our website. And there's also a flyer with all of the needs in the foyer in the back. Next, we want to remind you that next week, we're going to have an incredible Christmas play during Sabbath school time. Here, take a look. What do a cowboy, a pirate, and a cheerleader have in common? You'll find out on December 3 at 10.30 a.m. right here in the sanctuary for our annual Children's Choir Christmas Musical. We've been working real hard on our part. Arr! So please invite your family and friends to start off this Christmas season with a special presentation of an out-of-the-box Christmas. December 3, 10.30 a.m. On December the 4th, we mentioned this last week, but we are going to have a special music program it's a Sunday at five o'clock. It is celebrating 21st century Hispanic women composers. Come on out and enjoy a really special evening. Our annual Christmas candlelight concert is just around the corner. Here, take a look at this video for more information. This year's Christmas candlelight concert is on December 10. In 1997, I wrote a little arrangement for my cellist friend, Jeff Kotz uh, of Silent Night that we performed at that year's concert. We were asked to perform it the next year and the next, and we have performed it at the end of every concert since. 10 years ago, I added a third part for my son, and so now it's a trio. And this year marks the 25th year of that tradition. So I hope you'll join us. Tickets are online, and we hope to see you there. Please mark your calendars for December the 17th. That is our annual Messiah sing-along. It's a really fun time to be singing together, the congregation, as well as the choir members. The only thing you do need to remember is to bring your own words for the music because those will not be provided for you. Um, but yeah, we hope you're here December the 17th so that we can all sing together. It's always a great service. It is, for sure. Last but not least, there's a great opportunity to support our music ministry here at the church. It's our annual season's greeting. And you just go to our homepage, you'll see a button that says season's greetings, music ministry. You click there and you can donate. We really encourage you to do that. That's it for announcements. We have a lot of announcements. Yeah, it's a, big, a lot going on. There's tons going on, but go to our website. You can check out the bulletin. There are a lot of ways to get all the details if you don't remember what we've said today. And with that, we hope you have a wonderful day. We love you guys. Happy Sabbath.
Good morning. I'd like to welcome each of you here in the sanctuary and those online, including our ministry partner, LLBN. I really hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. I know the holidays are always challenging. For some, it's a wonderful time. Others, it's a very challenging time. Whatever your situation, we want to welcome you to worship and may you be blessed. And now I invite you to stand to sing our hymn of praise.
us pray. Our gracious God, we come before you this morning with praise on our lips and thanksgiving for this week and the, the many celebrations that we had with family and friends and others. And we pray for those who may not have had that experience and ask that you will be with them. But we want to thank you for the ma majestic mountains that we have here and for the powerful Pacific Ocean that's nearby and for the beautiful flowers that will spring up this spring in the desert and so much beauty around us. We're grateful for that. But that just reminds us that you are the God of creation, the all-powerful God. And we are grateful also for your unconditional love in sending your son, Jesus, to die for each of us and to give us hope and the promise of new life and eternal life. And we're thankful also for the church family that we have that is so supportive. And we ask that you will help each of us to be a part of that support. And we remember those who are ill, those who are at either at home or in the hospital. Bless them where they are. Bring healing to them. And we remember those who are not with us anymore. And we ask that you will be with those who are grieving, that you will bless them and give them comfort. And as Pastor Randy concludes the series this today, we pray that you will be with him and empower him. We're thankful for the things we have learned during this series and the experience that we can take with us and put into practice in our lives that we will communicate better and have better relationships. But most of all, we long for that day when Jesus will come and put an end to all the, the wars and the strife, the shootings. But most of all, we want to see Jesus face to face and be with him. And we're thankful that that day is coming and we want to be a part of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This is your special time, so come on up here. We are going to do something so much fun today. Oh, I see you coming. Do I have any other boys and girls? Let's see, there you come. Come on down right here. Oh, what a beautiful Sabbath day it is. Come right over here, because I'm going to need your help. I can't do this alone. So come right on over here. Ariana, come down here. Come down here, yeah. Oh, I have some big help. I love that. Oh, you guys all want to sit over here? Okay, how many of you ate way too much food this week? Rub your tummy. Mm-hmm. Wasn't Thanksgiving dinner so good? Did you have some treats? 
and some yummy things in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I am glad that I have some school-age kids because we're going to play a game today, and I need your help. You see, um, this game, I don't actually know what I am, and you're going to have to answer my questions to tell me what I am, as I guess. I'll be very careful not to look at this screen, but maybe some of you know this also named as headbands, but it has a Thanksgiving twist to it, okay? So I have my little headband that I'll put on here, and I have some cards. Now they're face down. Okay. You choose a card. Ooh, that's a good one. Now don't show me. Don't show me what that is. Okay, can everybody else see what it is? Show it to everybody else. Did you show it to everybody else? Okay. Now, give it to me face up, okay? Here. Let's see, is this upright or downright? This is the right way, okay. Now, okay, am I a person? No. I'm not a person. Am I a thing? No. I'm not a thing. Am I an object? Okay, place. Am I a place? No. no. Not a person, place, or thing. Um, am I an emotion? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, am I sad? No. No. Am I happy? Yes. I'm happy. So I'm an emotion, and I'm happy. Um, can, can I share this with others? Yes. yes. Okay, I can share this with others. Can I do it at home? Yes. Can I do it at church? Yes. So I can share it with others. I can do it at home. I can do it at church, and I'm an emotion. Um, who is it in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible. Okay, let me see if I can guess. Thankful. No? Oh, this is harder than I thought. Am I giving? Is the word giving? No? Uh, generous? No. Um, what's another word for generous, thankful? Uh, grateful. Yes! Is that what it is? Oh, my goodness, that was fun. I am grateful. Well, you know, boys and girls, that is a Thanksgiving twist because grateful is something we feel. Like you told me, it's an emotion. But when we have these warm, happy feelings, you're right. We have to share them. We have to put them in action. So what's the action that goes with grateful? Hmm, maybe it's being generous and sharing it with others. Well, if we're generous, how can you be generous? What, what can you be generous with? Hmm, maybe you can be generous with your time. Time like practicing when you don't want to practice so that maybe you can share that gift of a musical instrument with somebody else? Or, or what about um, generous with your allowance? Maybe it's a little bit of an extra offering. Or, or what about generous with your words? Telling people how much you appreciate them. Boys and girls, I don't want you just to think about thankfulness and gratitude this week, even though we focus on it this week. I don't want you to think of those warm, happy feelings just this month. I want you to think about those feelings that you have of gratitude, think how you can share them with others, and I want you to think about it all year long. Thank you so much for playing a game with me. You can go back to your seats now.
Good morning, church family. I'm holding in my hands a model. You might remember it in the back of the foyer over the years. It's a model of the family ministries building. It's really cool. It's very heavy. <laughs> but it represents, it represents the heavy lifting that we have financially. And it dawns on me that I shouldn't be doing this alone. So I've asked my friend Doug Smith to come up and to help me carry the family ministry's building burden. And I really appreciate it right about now. Thank you, Doug. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that the generations of this church all must be involved in this family ministry's building program. It turns out that the senior ministry, the older seniors in this church are carrying the vast majority of the load, but they can't do it alone. So if I was to represent the middle age uh, generation, the 20s and 30s, maybe the 40s, pushing, <laughs> pushing 40s, and Doug was to represent the senior community, that's still not enough. We need a younger generation to be involved with us. So I've asked my friend Andrew Karpenko, he's 12, to come up and to help us. Ladies and gentlemen, financially speaking, if we band together all generations, we can carry this load. Did you know that our monthly obligation is very steep, but we've been doing it through the Lord for 10 years, amen? I'm so excited. It's a miracle that I never expected. God reminds me regularly that he's in charge of this building program, and I wanna say thank you to all the generations, the younger ones, the older ones, and the middle ones who have family. Thank you for supporting this building program. On December 17, we have a very special Sabbath, and we hope that you will make a sacrificial gift, as is our custom, to help get ahead of our building program financially. Thank you for helping us build for his kingdom. I'll take it. Thank you.
in case you happen to be joining us because you're in town visiting family for Thanksgiving. We not only want you to feel welcome, but let me just make a comment about our current series that concludes today. We've been doing a back-to-the-classroom kind of theme and approach, it included things like blackboards and books and assignments and all the rest. And today we come to the final. We've built a fair part of this series around the Bileswick Mantel for theological relationships in a family, covenant, grace, empowering, and intimacy. And last week we talked about how intimacy is shown in a couple's or even in a family's ability to communicate deeply and openly. But part of that communication inevitably is conflict. Conflict. We wish conflict were a choice, but it's a given. If you have two people who both think you're going to have conflict, it's not a choice, it's a given. However, how you manage it, that can be a choice. So I have a couple of people who've agreed to help me this morning. The first is Alana. I'm going to ask Alana to come out. They're both backstage because I didn't want them to see what the other was doing. And uh, they're going to help me play a little game up here this morning. Alana, come right on up, right on over here. This is actually a pretty simple game. Uh, I'm going to ask Alana, first of all, can you tell us who you are? Because you and I actually just met out front. Isn't that right? It's true. Your name is? Alana. Alana Augustine. Augustine. All right. And... Uh, when you came to church this morning, you said, man, I hope I get to be part of the sermon, and God answered that prayer. So, <laughs> now I'm going to ask you to play a little game with me, Alana, and it's a very simple game. It's a game called tic-tac-toe, all right? Should've you should have practiced. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to give you, since you're a little bit on the spot, Alana, I'm going to give you the first move, so you're already at an advantage. My X's or O's? You choose what you wish. All kinds of choices. All right. Very good, Alana. Good choice. Huh. <laughs> All right. Very good. Excellent. You're good at this game. <laughs> Perfect. He's cheating on the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I won. Is that right? Yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. All right, Alana, thank you very much. Now, if you would just stand here for a minute and send out Barry as well. Uh, Barry is one of our deacons, and he too arrived this morning and thought he was just going to be a deacon, but he's actually going to help me this morning. Come on over, Barry. Um, now, hang on one sec. Well, no, you can't tell. Come on. Come on over here. I'm going to hand you this, and I'm going to hand you this. And we're going to play, just like we did with Alana, a game of tic-tac-toe. And since you're on the spot, you get to move first. So you go ahead. So this is a different approach, okay. Very good. All right. There we go. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> well, I guess I won both games. Alana, come over here a minute. I want to talk to the two of you. So you can turn and face the congregation. I just, you can share the mic back and forth. Where did you learn to play tic-tac-toe? Uh, probably grade school. Grade school, Alana? Yeah, from my cousins. From your cousins. And you remember location, home, school? Probably in the car. In the car, all right. You all are good people. I was afraid one of you was going to say during the sermon at church. But <laughs> um, another question. Before we started to play why didn't you ask me the rules? I thought you understood the rules. <laughs> okay. Alana? Yeah, the rules seemed pretty universal. Pretty universal. All right. One last question. Where did you learn to fight? That is to have conflict with people you care about. Probably in school. School. Okay. Probably at home. Home. Very good. All right, you all have been very helpful. Thank you. You can give them the mic back there. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask Richard if you would mind coming up and erasing this. So I want to point out, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to Alana and to Barry. They were very helpful, and it's a little bit awkward to suddenly stand up, and you don't know what's going on, so I really appreciate that. 
Here's the curious reality. I wouldn't have asked what the rules were either. I mean, it's tic-tac-toe, right? We're not doing rocket science. I would have done exactly what both Barry and Ilana did, and that is I would have assumed we all are playing by the same rules, right? I mean, tic-tac-toe. What's curious to me is we make that, we make that assumption, and we start playing, and then somebody changes the rules. Now we have a choice. Now we have a decision to make. Am I going to just keep playing? Did I lose? Are we going to fight over how to play the game? What exactly are we going to do now? Now, they were 50-50. Barry said, I learned to fight school. I learned to fight at home. Most of us, I would suggest, if asked the question, where did you learn how to do conflict, most of us would probably say at home. Watching mom and dad or watching siblings or being involved with them, that's where we learned it. And, and we have those rules kind of ingrained within us. We grow up with both spoken and unspoken systems of how it is that we do conflict. And then we grow up, and we go to school. We end up at Loma Linda University, and we're in the dental office, in the dental clinic. As a dental student, we're making eyes over the patient, thinking, that's a nice person over there. We fall in love. We get married. And nobody ever stops to say, okay, what are our covenants? What agreements do we make about how to have conflict? Because the truth is, virtually all kinds of fighting, almost any kind of fighting I can think of, has rules. You can, in fact, bomb another country, and the place is going up in smoke, and there are still things called Geneva Conventions that you're supposed to follow, rules about how to have conflict. You can put really hard gloves, they're not soft, hard gloves on the fist of two men, stick them in a ring, say, okay, I want you to go over there, and I want you to hit that guy so hard you give him a concussion. But as soon as he bites the other person's ear, you call the fight. You can't be biting each other's ears. It's like, wait a second. You're wanting me to give him a concussion. That's only his ear. I don't care. That's the rules. Can't do that. Fighting of all kinds has rules or parameters or boundaries or limits. So we come to family. We come to marriage. And we have to ask the question, what are the ground rules? What are the boundaries of our conflict? In fact, maybe an even more basic question is to ask, does it matter to God? Does God have something that would inform us? If we come to this book, are there principles that might help us in how we manage conflict in our home settings? Parents and children, siblings, husbands, wives, spouses, whoever it is. And I think the answer to that is yes. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about what helps create the problems. So I go to Scott Stanley again, his book, A Lasting Promise, A Christian Guide to Fighting for Your Marriage. I want you to listen to what Stanley writes. He says, there is a great deal of evidence. Remember, this book is not just based on biblical principles. It's based on his years of research. There is a great deal of evidence that distressed couples show major differences from happier couples in their ability to handle conflict. I came to the conclusion quite some years ago that if I only had one opportunity to sit down with a couple before they got married, and I had only one theme about which I could speak with them, that it would be conflict. You say, well, Randy, what about communication? What, what about sexuality? What about spirituality? I would say those are all key concepts. But if you cannot manage conflict well, it can become the, the, the rotten apple that sours the entire barrel. But if you can manage it well, you can get through most other realities. Second comment by Stanley. He says, by using only data 
before these couples married, he's describing a study in which they followed 135 couples for 12 years by using only data from when before they were married. We, along with a number of other researchers, have been able to differentiate those who do well over time from those who do not with 80 to 91% accuracy up to 12 years later. And then he writes, and I italicize it, italicizes it in the book, let this sink in for a moment. What this means is that for many couples, the seeds of distress and a future divorce are there early in the marriage and in many cases before a couple even says, I do. John Gottman is another one that says this has been true in his research. He says we can give an instrument to a couple, observe a couple before they're ever married and predict with right around 91% accuracy whether or not 10, 15 years later they'll still be married. And a lot of that is based on one simple reality, how they manage conflict. So, what does that mean? I want to suggest to you, this is not from Stanley or Gottman, this has been my own observation. You may disagree with it and you may be right, but at least consider it. I want to suggest to you that a core theme in conflict of all kinds, this goes far beyond family and marriage, but it certainly is true in family and marriage. A core theme regardless of what the individual topic might be, money or sex or child-rearing or religion or whatever else the topic might be, a core theme in all conflict is whether or not I feel like you are hearing me. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Do I have evidence coming back from you that you have taken in the message and understood it? When we think someone doesn't hear us, we turn up the volume. And we say it again a little bit louder. Did you hear that? Or a little louder. And then we begin to turn up the volume in other ways. We underline the problem by at times getting mean, at times, well, I want to show you some of the ways. Are you hearing me? So the ways in which couples handle that can differ rather widely. But two different research groups, one up in the Northwest, John Gottman, one in Denver, Stanley and Markman, have each decided that there are four ways in which we turn up the volume, as it were, four ways in which we have conflict that are so negative and so damaging that they are predictive of significant marital disharmony and can be precursors to divorce. So you may remember Gottman's. Gottman's are quite memorable because you hear them often in even the popular press. So criticism, in fact, he says these are so bad that he calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That ought to give us a clue. Criticism, contempt, um, trying to recall the third one. Uh, stonewalling, stonewalling is a third one. And the fourth one will come to me in a minute, Scotty, when you share it with me. So now Markman and Stanley, which is where I really want to focus, they talk about four negative conflict styles that, again, are so negative that they will damage deeply a marriage. And that's where I want to spend our time focusing today. Now, Scotty Ray and Kelly Lynn have... Did you volunteer? <laughs> no, come, come on up if you would. They have been willing to be our couple for today. As we look at these four negative conflict styles that can be so damaging that they predict marital disruption and potentially even divorce. Now, I intentionally chose a couple that is not married to each other because if you have those who are married to each other, it gets really awkward because you think, those people out there think we do this. We don't really do this. Uh, so, so these two are not married to each other, but for today's purposes, they will be. So four negative conflict styles. The first one that Markman and Stanley identify is one called escalation, escalation. So our couple 
is getting ready for the day in the bathroom, shaving, brushing teeth, combing hair, putting on makeup, doing all that stuff, getting ready for the day. When this happens, <laughs> you'd think you could at least put the cap back on the toothpaste. Oh, and you never forget to put it back? As a matter of fact, I always put it back on. Oh, I forget just how compulsive you are. You're right, of course. I don't even know why I stay with you. You're so negative. Maybe you shouldn't stay. No one's barring the door. I don't really know why I do stay anymore. Now, before you think, wow, you wrote that to really overemphasize the challenge, these are all four actual scenarios from couples that Markman and Stanley have studied. So notice what happens in this case. There's a very simple issue, and within less than 30 seconds of the beginning of that simple issue, they're talking divorce. This is a distressed couple. That's no secret. The question is, how did they get so distressed? Well, part of the reason is you simply cannot continue to escalate and escalate without the marriage feeling more and more precariously balanced on the edge of the precipice. You just can't do it. What is escalation? Escalation is hearing what the other says and then upping the ante, making the threat more significant in a hostile way in an attempt to get the other person to hear what you're saying. Listen to me. This is serious to me. And instead of listening, the other person now ups the ante and goes on the attack. And it continues. And soon it is too humiliating for either one of them to back down. Now understand, escalation is not the escalation of emotions. People can go from feeling fairly, fairly happy to being upset quite quickly. That's not what escalation is. Escalation is the content, the hostile content that gets said to the other, I would suggest, in the attempt to get the other one to hear what it is that I'm saying. Very damaging. Now, the truth is, it's amazingly simple, not easy, but simple to deal with this. You remember the wise man who said, a gentle answer turns away anger? If one of you will just listen and then say, I understand, that's frustrating. I'll do it differently next time. The whole scenario gets undone and de-escalates. So that's the first negative conflict style, escalation. The second one is invalidation. Invalidation. This is painful put-downs. These are the kinds of statements that are disrespectful and demeaning and even contemptuous that hurt the other person. So we go back to our couple. It's Tuesday evening. They're joining together for dinner. And it's at that time that Kelly discovers that Scotty has forgotten to go to his doctor's appointment. And this is what happens. You've missed your doctor's appointment again? You're so irresponsible. I could see you dying and leaving me just like your father. Thanks a lot. You know I'm nothing like my father. He was a creep, and so are you. I'm sorry. I forgot what a blessing and good fortune it is for me to be married to such a paragon of responsibility. You can't even keep your purse organized. <sighs> At least I'm not so obsessive about stupid little things. You are so arrogant. How would you like to be at that dinner table? <laughs> you can hear the contempt coming off of both sides of the table. Now, what's curious is that both Stanley and Markman in their research with invalidation and Gottman with his research in terms of contempt say that this one is the one that is the most predictive of damaging relationships for the future and potential divorce. The most predictive. 
because it demeans the other person and puts them down. It calls them names. It questions their judgment. It questions them as a person. It calls out things about them that they can't change, such as their family and other realities. And it does so contemptuously, exceedingly damaging. Again, part of it is in the attempt to get the other person to hear the point you're making, to hear the seriousness of your point. But the problem is, because you are so much on the offensive, the other one puts up a big defense, and the best defense is a good offense, so now they come after you. And very quickly, it spins out of control. Invalidation. Contempt. But there's another one that Stanley and Markman talk about. This one they call negative interpretations. Negative interpretations could also be called mind reading because what this approach basically says is, I know what you're saying, but what you're saying is not what you mean. What you really mean is, and then they tell you what you really mean. So, this is a pretty troubled couple, by the way, just in case you were wondering. Uh, so in this case, uh, Kelly comes to Scotty. He's doing some of the bills, and it's, it's like this time of the year. Christmas is coming up. She wants to go see her family for Christmas. They have a child involved, and, and yet Scotty's concerned about the finances. Can they afford to do this? This is what happens. We should start looking into plane tickets to go visit my parents this holiday season. I was really wondering if we can afford it this year. <laughs> My parents are very important to me. Even if you don't like them, I'm still gonna go. I would like to go, really I would. I just, I don't see how we can afford $1,000 in plane tickets and pay the bill for you, Joey's orthodontist. You can't even be honest and admit that you just don't even want to go. Just admit it. You don't like my parents. There's nothing to admit here. I enjoy visiting your parents. I, I'm talking and thinking about money here, not your parents. That's a convenient excuse. <sighs> so the question becomes, when somebody tells you what you're thinking, how do you convince them otherwise? There is no way out of that argument with the person who may legitimately be thinking someone else, thinking something else, feeling like he or she is honored. Unless you are able to say what you mean, mean what you say, and trust each other when you say it. Now, let's be fair to Kelly here. There may be some reason in the past for which she thinks Scotty doesn't like her family. That may be a legitimate concern. And then she just simply needs to say, listen, is this really about money or is this about how you feel about my parents? And if he is honest and says, no, it's about money, then it's her choice as to whether or not to trust that. Is he trustworthy in what he's saying? If, however, he says, well, honestly, yeah, I'm not real wild after last year about going back. Then they need to deal with that on the basis of its own merits. But the challenge here is one of trust. Can I trust my partner to be telling me the truth with what he or with what she says? Mind reading, negative interpretations, is one of the most difficult negative conflict styles to overcome. The fourth one is withdrawal and avoidance. In this one, one partner, typically, doesn't want to deal with what the issue is. Whatever the problem it is that has surfaced, he or she doesn't want to take it on. And so uses strategies to not do that. I think, I think that this may be, of any of the four negative conflict styles, the most common one in this community. And I'll tell you simply why I say that. When you get home after a busy day at, at, at your attorney's office, if you're an attorney, the construction site, if you're a contractor, of being on call if you're up at the hospital, and you're wiped out tired, and your spouse says, we need to talk about such and so, what is your automatic response? I'm tired. I don't want to deal with that. Please, can you not leave me alone and deal with this at another time? 
Well, that's a fair statement at points in time about certain issues. But the question becomes, does it become an enduring pattern? So back to Kelly and Scotty. So this time, Kelly has some concerns about how Scotty is doing his anger, especially in light of their child, and she's wanting to talk about it. And so she approaches Scotty, and this happens. When are we going to start talking about how you're handling your anger? Can't you see I'm busy? I've got to get these taxes done. I've brought this up at least five times already. No, I can't wait. What's to talk about anyways? It's none of your business. Tanya is my business. I'm afraid that one day you will get angry and you are going to hurt her and you won't do a single thing to learn to deal better with your anger. I love Tanya. There's no problem here. You have to get some help. You can't just stick your head in the sand like this. I'm not going to discuss anything with you when you're like this. Like what? It doesn't matter if I'm calm or frustrated. Whenever we have something important to talk about, you just don't want to talk to me about it. Tanya's having problems, and you have to face that. Well? I'm going out for some peace and quiet. You have to talk to me now. Every time we have something important to talk about, you leave, and I'm tired of you leaving. I'm not talking. You are. Actually, you're yelling. See you later. If you've ever been Kelly in this scenario, you know just exactly how maddening it can be to have an important issue and someone you love and the unwillingness to even recognize it, much less talk about it. Deeply challenging. One of the ways you can tell that this has been going on is when a fairly main, minor incident causes a rather major eruption. It's the proverbial balloon that you're... <sighs> it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and <sighs> until finally it gets to the point that all it needs is one more <sighs> and it explodes because there is so much in there already. People who man use this to manage their conflict have great difficulty. In fact... Curiously, Stanley says that in this case, as common as it is, it is just that damaging. So then our question becomes, why focus on the negative? Both Gotten's team and Stanley and Markman's team both do that. And the reason is simple. They say if we can identify the things that will introduce poison into the relationship and eliminate those then there is a vast array of ways in which, which we can interact and deal with conflict. Scripture would underline that as well. You will find many different passages, particularly in the wise man's writings, regarding how to deal with issues of anger and difference between people. So how do we do it? Let me first say this. I have come to the personal conclusion. You may disagree with this, but I've come to the personal conclusion that arguing, that arguing, argument, is never positive. I don't know if I should use an overgeneralization like never. Maybe I would say arguing is almost never positive in a relationship. However, conflict is not only a given, but can be an opportunity to learn and grow. In other words, peace and quiet isn't all that it's cracked up to be because since conflict is a given, if we can learn to do it in respectful ways, it actually can help us grow. So you say, is this just a problem of semantics? How can you say on the one hand that argument or arguing may never be positive in a relationship, but conflict can be an opportunity to grow? How can you say that? I would say it plainly and simply because I think these two realities have different goals. So let's take argument or arguing. It's a very important part of the fabric of our society. 
We've just come out of a time, and soon we'll go into another time, where politicians are running against each other. And they will draw a crowd together, and one will stand there, and one will stand there, and somebody will sit here in the moderator's chair, and we'll ask them each questions, and they will each make their argument. In essence, they're arguing against each other. Different visions for what will help their community, their society, their culture, whatever it is. And as long as we can stay civil, which seems to be a real problem these days, as long as we can stay civil, that has a positive role to play in society. Or take the legal profession. When there is a case that's being argued before a judge and a jury, each attorney, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, will stand up and will make their argument. They will try to convince the jury that this is true or that that is true. They're making an argument. It has a deeply important role to play in our society. But understand clearly that the goal of argument or arguing is to win. That's what we're trying to accomplish when we argue. We're trying to win the argument. If between two people who are connected by a love relationship, the goal becomes win. I have got to win this. You're both going to lose no matter who wins. Because you've set up a scenario where it's win, lose. One wins, one loses, and truthfully, they both lose. However, when it comes to conflict, thought of in the best ways, the goal of conflict is to understand, in other words, that's what I'm doing for the other person to understand and to be understood. The goal then becomes a very different reality. Curiously, these two may sound a lot alike. There, there may be anger involved. There may be passion involved. There may be wrestling with feelings and with trying to make the other person clearly hear my point. But this, the goal of each, divides them dramatically. Because if I'm in a situation with Anita that we have or I have cast as win-lose, we're going to head, we're going to end up in a very negative space. But if we can both have the goal that says, I want to understand you better, and I would like you to understand me better, it's a very different outcome. So maybe the first step is to realize anger, feelings of despair, dejection, hope, disappointment, all of those are all part of the reality of conflict. But the question is, what are we trying to accomplish here? What is our ultimate goal? One of the most helpful things for me in terms of conflict, whether it be marital or family or even larger like a church, came from Scott Cormo, a professor of leadership down at Fuller Seminary who said, if you can have a relationship that allows you to say or gives you the freedom to feel that this, whatever it is that we're facing, this will not undo us. This will not undo us. It alleviates you from the fear that often pervades fighting and leads it in a negative direction. If you can look at your mate, even in the midst of the challenge, and say, this will not undo us. We will get through this. It will not cause us to come apart. You strike at the foundation of one of the deepest fears that conflict creates. Because even if you don't have the fear that this is going to lead us to divorce, you do often have the fear, this is going to ruin our Thanksgiving. This is going to ruin our evening out. This is going to spoil our week away. And if you can speak to that and say, this is not going to undo us, we're going to get through this, and then we're going to move on and have a good time. This will not undo us. Now, what about Scripture? What might Scripture have to offer us in this vein? We could go to the Proverbs, as we've done before in this series. But I actually want to go to the New Testament, to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, which is the section of Ephesians where I think Paul makes his most incisive comments about how to live together in community. 
A lot of what he's going to say that I'm going to read is said against the backdrop of Ephesians 4.15, where he's talking actually about doctrinal differences, but he lays out a principle that applies to relational differences as well. In that context, he says, speak the truth, but do it in love. Speak the truth, but do it in love. So with that statement, Paul creates a bit of a tension between truth and love, a tension that always needs to be maintained, especially in the presence of conflict. Speak the truth, do it in love. If you don't speak the truth, the issue won't be fully resolved within you because you'll look back and say, there's more to it than that that I didn't say. But if you don't do it in love, the issue will be very difficult for the other person to swallow because it will feel so mean-spirited. So against that backdrop of speaking the truth in love, I want to read just a few verses of what Paul says, starting in verse 25. This is all under the heading of instructions for Christian living. This is wider than just family, but what if we lived these in family? He starts in verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Speak the truth, in other words. Be truthful about what you're saying. As you think about truth and being truthful, it will attack several of these negative conflict styles. Remember that we're part of one body. So he's balancing it with love. That's verse 25. Verse 26, he says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, there can be the temptation to be overly literalistic about that. I can remember that in our marriage, and it is in my first year of marriage. We're up at, I don't know what time it was, one in the morning, and I'm saying, We got to get this settled before we go to bed. She's like, Just go to bed. We can deal with this tomorrow. No, don't let the sun go down. Well, wait a minute. The sun already went down. But anyway, don't go to bed mad. Okay? Don't be overly literalistic. If you're overly literalistic, just the sun can't go down, move to Alaska. You can be mad all summer. (laughs) Take what Paul is saying and its principle, which is keep short accounts. Stay up to date on your emotional issues. Don't let them build up. And again, we're dealing with one of the negative conflict styles. Keep short accounts. On to the next verse. And do not give the devil a foothold. So he's saying, keep short accounts. Don't give the devil a foothold. Do you know what a foothold is? If you look it up in a dictionary, a foothold is a place where you can put your foot so as to further project you in the direction you're already wanting to go. So against the backdrop of anger, Paul is saying, keep short accounts, don't stay angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't use your anger as a launching point to now go out and do more damaging things to your relationship. Don't allow the devil to do that for you. Then the next verse, anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. He's talking clearly about people who have been in the custom of of stealing and of doing things for their own benefit. What if we apply that principle to the realities of human intimate relationships? You know how I would summarize what Paul is saying? He's saying, don't be all about you. Don't live in this take, take, take mentality that takes away from you just to preserve me and what I want. Rather, he says, be open-handed, not tight-fisted. Be open-handed with the people you live with, allowing them to make choices and going along cheerfully with what they decide and choose. That would do a great deal to damage some of these negative conflict styles. And then Paul goes on, Imagine this one. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Wow. Our words can be so damaging. 
Whenever I read this, I go back in my mind to an American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists conference I attended in Washington, D.C., where one of the leaders of research in the field stood up and talked about his research and what it was showing relative to marital conflict. And at one point in his presentation, he just kind of paused and said, you know, after all of this research, I've concluded one thing. Most of the problems we have in our marriages and families, most of the problems we have, he said, are simply due to the way we talk to each other. This was a secular researcher. Just the way we talk to each other. And then you read Paul. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but do what is helpful for building up others. What a difference that would make in our families, in our marriages, even in the context of conflict. If we determine not to damage the other, to keep the problem the problem, it would make a profound difference in how we relate to one another in all kinds of settings, but certainly in our family settings. And then Paul says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, live in a way that would make the Spirit feel welcome in your relationship, even in the midst of conflict. Determine in your mind it is possible to be angry and respectful. It's easy to be angry and disrespectful, but it's possible to be angry and respectful and create space for the spirit in your relationship. And then Paul closes off this section by what I think is one of the most powerful statements just for relationships as a whole, but certainly for relationships in marriage and family settings. He says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We need the Spirit to live that out. But just imagine if we did live that out. If we were determined in our family relationships, even in our differences, even in our conflicts, to not allow anger to control it, to use conflict as an opportunity to understand and be understood and to determine to be respectful even in the midst of the difference. It just may transform our families into the kinds of covenantal relationships where we know grace and where we know empowerment and where we know intimacy. So in this last lesson, I have an assignment for you. This is possible for any of you to do whether you have kids or siblings or whether you're married or not, it's possible for anyone. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. This week, this coming week, when you sense conflict is building, in any of those situations, I want you to remember and do something that is not original with me but I think is a great suggestion. After a quick help me prayer, three steps. You ready for these? Three simple steps is your assignment in the context of conflict. Step number one, let the other person tell their story. That's going to be tough. That's step one. Let the other person tell their story. Step two, let the other person tell their whole story. That's going to be even tougher. Let the other person tell their whole story. Step three, Let the other person tell their whole story first. (laughs) Nothing else, just that. Then you can go on to whatever it is you need to bring to it. But remember, asking the Spirit to guide and to help, asking the Spirit to fulfill the realities of what Paul is writing, when you can feel it beginning, let the other person tell their story. Let the other person tell their whole story. Let the other person tell their whole story first. And may God bless you, and may God help us all.
Gracious God, thank you. Thank you that it matters to you how we conduct our relationships and that we can look to you to understand how you treat your family and then pattern ourselves after that. We ask for your presence, your grace, and your blessings. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you, and stay for the post -lead. Best greetings, everybody. So glad to be in touch with you again this week. I've had some fascinating things happen, including stories that people give me along with greetings and pictures. So listen up, I think you'll enjoy these too. I want you folks to meet Pastor William Curlew, Naples, Florida, 102 years old. Look at this handsome pastor and then see him there with his family group, at least three generations of them, I think. But look at this one as he's out in his yard doing what he loves to do best. Marion Lacusta, Kelowna, British Columbia, 89th birthday, this young lady. And look at her there, 
treating her dog like a dog deserves to be treated. And then she's with daughters and granddaughters, but finally, look where she snuggles in. Hello to Beverly Costa, Rehoboth, Massachusetts, 92nd birthday. And warmest congratulations, lady, as I see you also at the organ. And this is greetings to Pat Maxwell Heisler, who now lives in Chula Vista, California. This first picture, you look up in the left corner and you see a circle around a boy and a girl. The girl is Pat and the boy is Bill and they are now married. And I get to know this because this is Pat's birthday. And the next picture, Pat and Bill and Pat's sister are walking the beach. And then we get to see them down Chula Vista way. Warmest congratulations to you two. And thank you for the amazing story. And Carol Howerton, Maricopa, Arizona. Happy birthday, lady. And glad to see you there with husband Dennis. Hello, Brett Wall, Lumberland University Church. Congratulations on 50 years, man. And get to see you there with your beautiful wife and then with your handsome sons. We appreciate you in the sanctuary brass also, Brett. Patricia Rice, happy birthday, lady. Ukiah, California way. Your family is so proud of you. And Jim Ayers, Altamont Springs, Florida, I think it is. Congratulations on your birthday, Jim, and glad to see you there in a happy place with your wife. Andre Nikitin lives in Razan, Russia. And I met him first 29 years ago when he became my translator in Russia. And now he's back there because that's where he's helping care for his folks. And there he is just in from a mushroom picking excursion with his dad. Happy birthday, Andre. Artis Hawkins lives in Kamii, Idaho, and Artis is 93 years old, and she's my cousin. Happy birthday, Artis. Hello, Sam Young, a part of our family here in Loma Linda. Congratulations on your birthday, Sam. Glad to see you there with dear Helen, and then with your four sons, all of you, Pathfinders, Jilda Roddy, Ellicott City, Maryland. Yes, we remember you on our pastoral staff here, Jilda. And there you are with your family. Hello, Ben Anderson, Sublimity, Oregon. My friend for a long, long time. Congratulations on your birthday, Ben. And Judy Christensen Griffin, Boring, Oregon. Wow. So glad to know about your birthday, Judy, and I wish you all the very best. And that goes for you too, Willard Beeman at the Villa in Loma Linda, 97th birthday. Wow, we were a part of an evangelistic team. Yes, a number of years ago. And a big hello to Jesse Orser. Dear, dear Jesse, 98th birthday. Congratulations, we love you, Jesse. And that shows as you're snuggled in with a lot of your friends at a party. Zoltan Hangel, a part of our family, we appreciate you so much, a part of the prayer ministry in Loma Linda. And then this picture with your lovely wife, baby. Hello, Fred Self, a chaplain with Dignity Health, and so glad to be reminded of you and a part of your family. Cheryl Williamson. Thank you, thank you, Cheryl, for letting me know about your birthday and for sending me a picture of that canine member of your family. Congratulations, Cheryl. Hello, Donna Wolf, Springville, California. 84th birthday, Donna. There you are with that handsome husband and then your son and your daughter. Kenneth Kenny Kester, Toledo, Ohio. An aspiring truck driver, folks. Just see him there with his mother, Randy, and his brother, Chris. James Pang, Grandpa James, yes, I wish I could see you more, but I'm glad to know about your birthday and I wish you all the best. And that goes for you too, Kenneth Mickey Purdom, Whittier, California, a 
college classmate of mine and a graduate of Loma Linda University School of Medicine. He has delivered more babies than I think he can count. Congratulations, Mickey, on another birthday. Hello, Jeff Kao. Dr. Kao, a part of the University Medical School and there with your son, because your birthdays are pretty close together, and then with dear wife Donna, and another grandchild, I think. Hello, Jerry Hoyle, Redlands, California, part of our family here at Loma Linda. There you are with dear Sharon, and then with son Gary, and a grandson. But I couldn't resist the Wedgwood Trio. Yes, to think of you is to think of Don, and to think of Bob, and we look forward to seeing and hearing you whenever we can. Hello, Charles T. Smith, Jr., Riverside, California. Wow, so glad to know about your birthday, Charles, and be reminded of your dear dad. Hello, Dr. Reg Rice up Placerville, California way. Glad to know about your birthday, too, and I wish you all the best. And that goes for you, Rudy Miloshenko, Oroville, California. Happy birthday, man, and glad to see you there with LaVon. And Lanita Medina, Camden, Maine. Wow, happy birthday, lady. There you are with granddaughter Ramona, I think. Then with mother Betty Adams and husband Norman. Michelle and Scott Cady also live in Meridian, Idaho. And this is their 32nd anniversary. I know that because I had the rich privilege of marrying them and then I get to see what I call the offspring of their lives, two daughters, and then the canine member of their family. Yes, it's good to be with you one more week, and I'm glad for this special Thanksgiving week, and I wish all the best to you. Friends, good to see all of you here this Sabbath day. It is one happy Thanksgiving, I'll tell you, especially for Rebecca and Josh. They are a married couple with several kids, but they also are a married couple who's making the decision together today Amen. to walk in faithfulness before the Lord and commit their lives to Jesus. They have been part of our church community for some time now, but today they're making one of the biggest commitments ever. Now, I didn't actually meet them. One of our newest pastors on the staff, who I know kind of well, actually yeah. met them. Yes, we met, uh, my wife and me, we met them on spring over there in one of these children's parks, and Josh was sitting on the bench and reading the Bible. And my wife said, are you reading the Bible? Josh said, yes. And since then, I jump in and studying the Bible with Philip together, with both of them. And they are uh, today together here. And we are so glad and praise the Lord. You have to be careful where you read your Bible. If a pastor sees it, he's, he's going in. Well, today, Josh and Rebecca are also here with friends, and they, we want to encourage you, if you know Josh and Rebecca or are willing to stand here as part of their spiritual family, could you do that right now? There are some people here who are part of their Sabbath school ministry, and we want to ask you to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And in this very moment, Josh and Rebecca, because of your love and faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today you die with Christ. Amen. Praise the newness of life. Amen. Yes. Woo. God bless you. Love you, brother. God bless you. Brother. Yeah, you can hug each other. So fun. Yes. Yes. Let's come. 
Well, friends, this decision that they made can also be yours. You might be a married couple and you say, hey, pastor, we're ready to do that together. Come and see me. Uh, we'll keep this up for you and it'll be ready for you then. But you might be a young adult, might be a teenager. You might be someone maybe who's spent a season wandering and you've come back to the Lord. My encouragement to you today is, would you consider giving your heart to Jesus in one of the most public declarations of your faith in him in baptism. You can sign up online for baptism. You can just click on our church website on the forms and there you can do that. And also if you'd like to see one of our pastoral team, come see us. We'd love to journey with you in Bible study and taking this incredible plunge for the rest of your journey with Jesus. God bless you.